I'm a postdoctoral researcher uh, here at the Computational Biology Lab, um, coordinated by Dr. Panagiotta Boyazzi. Unfortunately, Dr. Boyazzi couldn't be here on the last day, so I'm going to introduce uh, today's uh, talk. Uh, so, we are pleased to have uh, Maurizio De Pita right? uh, here today with us. Uh, he pursued uh, his PhD studies in computational science at Ella Brick University uh, under the supervision of Professor Ben Deco. In June uh, 2013, he was awarded a uh, uh, postdoctoral fellowship for his research on the European Research Fellowship for Informatics and Mathematics. And he moved to French Institute for Research in Computer Science and Information in Lyon at the field group uh, coordinated by Professor Paul Carpe. Uh, he is also the recipient of an uh, international outgoing Mercury Fellowship. Uh, and by June 2014, he will move to Nicolas Brunel's group at the University of Chicago. Uh, he has been researching on theory and modeling of uh, neuroglia interactions uh, for the past uh, nine years. And uh, his presentation is going to be relevant to uh, this topic uh, as well. So, let's go with that. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Make very difficult questions, of course. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Panos and Yoka that uh, is hopefully observing this presentation from uh, home for inviting me over and having me over during this week. So today's lecture is dealing with uh, neuroglia interactions and how they could uh, play a role in the computation of the brain. For those of you that are not familiar with this field and those that are a little bit more, well, this is a very hotly debated topic in uh, computational neuroscience and neuroscience nowadays because over the past uh, 25 years, we have been uh, witnessing a growing, compelling amount of evidence that the glia and the main type of these cells found in the brain, in the astrocytes, could be involved in uh, the modulation of synaptic transmission, plasticity, memory formation, and so on. However, there is still no definite evidence and nor uh, a theoretical framework that could um, tackle why and how these positive cells could be involved in the many possible computational task performed by the brain. So look at this question, how astrocell compute. And in order to answer this question, of course so we have first to figure it out what we mean by computation, right? We all agree that our brains compute. So this means uh, that uh, the <coughs> process synaptic, uh, the process uh, information, they create uh, by this information some abstract representations of our world. And uh, they perform operations, they manipulate these uh, representations in order to eventually execute tasks. Almost uh, universally recognized, the substrate, the mechanistic substrate for these uh, computations, as we know, are the neurons, right? Their ability to generate electrical pulses, namely the action potentials, and to propagate them over long distances efficiently and fast and reliably makes uh, these cells uh, the main, if not the only, cells capable of a single new role in our brain. And uh, what I will uh, refer many times during these lectures, the readout of neuron activity is the so-called neuron code, the sequence or the ensemble of many sequences of action potentials whereby we believe that our brain process and uh, encode the code as uh, sensory information and execute eventually computational tasks. Now, historically, you may argue this view that uh, neurons are the only cells capable of a single neuron stems back you know, to the early period of modern neuroscience with the formalization of the neuron doctrine, in which it was a very fortunate period, in which eventually converged also all the tradition of uh, electromagnetism that in 1900 culminated with the formalization of the Maxwell equations, if you recall it. And the large interest towards electricity was also backed up by a long-standing tradition in the studies of the electrical properties of inner tissues. So all these elements brought, to, brought up the idea that if neurons are fundamental units uh, of, the, of the brain, 
then uh, they must be so also in light of the fact that they are the only electrically uh, excitable cells in the brain. And electricity appeared to our uh, ancestors as the ideal signal to transfer and convey information across the brain. And the distinction was so sharp that uh, all brain cells were divided between everything that is non-neuronal, uh, so that is not electrically excitable, and the neurons. Among the non-neuronal cells, we find our glia cells. The glia, well, they are in Greek, so it's the, in Greece, so it's the first time that finally I can say to you what this glia means. It means glue, right? I you understand it, amazing. And inside the glia cells, we find astrocytes. Now, they are non-electrically excitable. This means that if you look at the input-output characteristics of these astrocytes, well, what happened to be uh, or observed to our ancestors was something probably very boring. Because you inject <coughs> increasing currents in your astrocytes, and what you observe is not as in neurons the generation eventually of action potentials, but the increase proportional to the current that has been injected of the membrane potential. So just a non increase. So this shows that these cells are not electrically excitable. It takes about 100 years to figure it out that actually, actually astrocytes do have a form of excitability that is a chemical type and is based on the transient elevation of calcium ions intracellularly in response to stimuli. <coughs> These uh, calcium signals can be extremely variegated in their uh, uh, dynamics. They can uh, range from transient, uh, variegated, uh, isolated uh, elevations to oscillations. And they can be even traveling from one cell to another in astrocyte networks in the form of uh, intercellular calcium waves. So if you've never seen what uh, I'm talking about, here is a video of a culture of astrocytes in which uh, you have, uh, at a certain point, uh, the perfusion of a path of some chemical, which is our stimulus in this case. And you will see that right after the perfusion, all the cells light up and start flickering in a very complex fashion. The video is just uh, for the purpose of visibility, accelerated about 10 times, okay? Here is the path. Here we are. And here we are. You see, it resembles most uh, neuronal cultures, right, with the fact with the difference that this is calcium and this uh, signal is uh, at least uh, two or three orders of magnitude lower. So, because of this uh, strong resembles, here is the assumption for the reminder of this lecture. Of course, similarly to neurons, the readout of astrocyte is their calcium signal. So, calcium signaling, calcium activity, is something that mimics the activity of astrocyte in response to the stimulation. But I tell you even more. Take this example of this uh, simple experiment in which we have, again, a, glia, a culture of uh, glia, of astrocyte in particular, and we perfuse this culture with a step increase on some uh, chemical, carbacol in particular, which is an agonist of uh, muscarinic receptors found in astrocyte in culture. And what you observe is that stemming from control conditions without application before the application of the stimulus, once you apply the stimulus, that is really a step increase, okay, well, the dynamics of the ensuing calcium signal doesn't really follow the dynamics of the stimulus, but it's variegated somehow. Here they are oscillating with oscillations that are variable in the frequency and their amplitude, which allows me and you to infer that not only calcium is going to be the readout signal of astrocytic activity in response to stimuli, but it's something more. It can be thought as the code whereby astrocytes are actually performing some kind of processing, or at least that's the assumption for the reminder of the lecture, with respect to the stimulus. Now, challenging this uh, code and understanding how it is made and how, if even, can be considered a code, is uh, rather complex because traditionally the cells has been studied at the level of global calcium signals, okay? But uh, the source of these uh, signals is actually at the processes. Astrocytes have a tremendously complex morphology. 
And on the other hand, the special scales of transmission of, this, of these uh, signals can go inside networks and can range to several order of magnitude with respect to the single cell. So the question is, uh, is this code going to be preserved? Is, can be 10 calcium signals be folded as codes? And what are the conditions to, to think of them as codes? Which brings up the outline of today's lecture, starting exactly from the single cell, then uh, we will elaborate some arguments and thinking and think of how these uh, signals could be transmitted to other cells and they are transmitted in a reliable fashion. And uh, eventually we will discuss <coughs> if uh, and what these signals perform in terms of, uh, in terms of um, computations, if any. And uh, the last uh, few slides to put everything in the context of neural networks because that's uh, the, the climax of uh, all this uh, elaboration. So if we assume that uh, the calcium signal is the code uh, for, uh, is the putative code uh, for astrocyte 2 and code uh, stimuli, uh, we may take uh, some arguments uh, uh, from equivalent neural code and say that in order for calcium signals to be candidate codes, then uh, they must be, in turn, a reliable representation of the stimulus. And the way back, given the calcium signal, I need to, have to be sure that I can retrieve the original stimulus that triggered it. And once, because I have to perform, or astrocyte, I have to perform some kind of computation in our assumption, this code must be manipulated in a controlled fashion. So the transmission of these uh, signals between cells must follow some kind of rules that we need to ask them, we need to ask for what type they are. To tackle the first two elements, meaning representability and decodability, you may wonder, well, that's easy, just to find out the input-output response you know, uh, of, of an astrocyte. Well, that's easy for, from an uh, electrophysiological perspective. Because uh, you would be surprised to find out that despite 25 years of research in this field, some basic questions regarding these cells, such as, for example, their input-output characteristic in response to a whole range of stimulus, is not known. This is because cultivating single astrocyte cells is extremely challenging, is not realistic. There is no way right now to cultivate uh, realistically, morphologically, uh, morphologically realistic cell in culture, isolated. And also, there is no understanding of what could be actually the real nature of the stimulation. So in this uh, set of experiments, what we did, we consider a mixed uh, neuroglia cultures plated on uh, uh, microelectrical arrays. And we convey uh, electrical pulses of increasing frequencies to the network recording what is the global calcium activation in the old astrocytes of the network. Without entering into the details, um, you may guess uh, the source of these calcium signals recorded in the astrocytes, which are reported here in green, okay? And the red is just a sample of the, simulation, of the uh, stimulation, are a result of glutamate that is synaptically released in response to the neuron activity triggered by microelectrical micro arrays. As a matter of fact, you perfuse your culture with uh, some kind of antagonist of uh, glutamate receptors, and uh, in particular, antagonist of uh, well, glutamate receptors. Yes, and uh, you 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 see and abolish uh, you, you abolish essentially most of these uh, calcium responses. Then uh, you take all the global calcium responses in the culture, you average across different cultures to avoid possible artifacts related to the fact that each culture has allegedly a different number of astrocytes. And what you observe is, perhaps not surprisingly, something that is sigmoid shaped as a function of the frequency of stimulation, meaning that uh, there is a, a threshold after which the stimulus frequency lights up your culture. And uh, as you know, when you talk about, when you talk about, of course, the sigmoid-shaped uh, input-output uh, uh, responses, you have a region of integration of your uh, stimulus, and then a plateau which denotes saturation. 
The next stage, this is a global calcium response. So we are looking at the entire population, all right? Does this global calcium response reflect the response of individual astrocytes? Well, the quick answer is yes, but you have also to consider that right now I didn't tell you anything about what these cells are forming in the culture. They might be connected, right? So we don't know a priori if uh, these connections could actually influence the, 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 the response of these, of these cells with respect to the stimulation. For the next couple of slides, what I bring in is some kind of theoretical arguments that tells you, yes, the nature of sigmoid-shaped response is actually triggered and de depends very likely by the nature of the calcium machinery that uh, dictates the outcome, the calcium signals in these cells. Whereas the, the, the features of this sigmoid, namely how high is the plateau, where the threshold is, and how, and how um, steep is the slope of the intermediate range, depends probably on the connections that I will elaborate about. And when we talk about calcium signals in astrocytes, well, the machinery, I'm not sure if somebody from the audience is familiar with that, is known as calcium-induced calcium release which is a form of calcium signal in broad support <coughs> by the nonlinear properties of some receptors that uh, binds IP3, the second messenger IP3, found on the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. Just recall, the endoplasmic reticulum is the place where calcium is stored in your astrocyte, because calcium concentrations in astrocyte and in general in cells in the level of the cytoplasm can be high too much, otherwise the cell undergoes apoptosis and dies, okay? So it's stored inside the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, IP3 is uh, itself a signal that here represents uh, your stimulus, okay? It's directly connected with the stimulus, we'll see in a, in, a, in a while. When the IP3 binds to the receptor, it triggers an initial opening that uh, releases from the endoplasmic reticulum some calcium. Then these receptors have two sides for calcium, one of high affinity and the other one for low affinity. The one for high affinity is further activating. So more calcium in the cytoplasm is more opening the, the receptor. So that's the name, calcium induced calcium release. The more you open, the more you release calcium. This still that the calcium concentration reaches a value that is sufficient to bind to the site of low affinity and the receptor closes. So when you look at the probability of opening of these uh, receptors, you observe a bell-shaped uh, probability as a function of uh, the calcium concentration and a sigmoid shape as a function of your second messenger molecule IP3. Interestingly, as you probably figured it out, all of these curves are essentially thought as threshold-like phenomena. So when you do some kind of modeling and uh, you base your model on the receptor properties, what you observe is this kind of figure represent, uh, it's, it's lumping all the possible dynamic features. This is your calcium concentration as a function of your IP3 concentration. And you see that it takes a threshold value till you have a reliable peak, which denotes the activation. So the claim here is that the threshold of the calcium-induced calcium release machinery is actually responsible for the pressure. Even more, the same mechanism, if you see, even shapes the frequency of your calcium oscillations in response to the IP3. Now, the next stage is to ask whether, the, once you consider IP3 signaling, something changes. Because there is, I didn't show you the direct clapping. IP3 is directly coupled with your glutamate in our cultures, released from synapses. And uh, IP3 is produced uh, by a complex uh, a cascade of uh, signaling pathways that are negated by isoenzyme, phospholipase C, beta, and, ga and delta. And it's degraded by multiple pathways. And to, to complicate everything, the, metabolo the, the metabolism of IP3 is coupled to calcium dynamics. So the two signals work in tandem. But surprisingly, perhaps enough, what it turns out is that when you look at some uh, simulations of your synaptic release, here just periodically to depict a naive uh, proof of concept, 
a new map, the ensuing IP3 concentration, what you observe is that the IP3 concentration is actually growing almost uh, in a way that can be thought as proportional to the number of release events till it reaches a threshold, and that threshold is responsible eventually for the activation of your calcium signals. So the IP3 is essentially a linear integration in this respect of your synaptic stimulus. And then the calcium itself can be seen as a nonlinear deformed by the by the, the, the features of calcium induced calcium release transformation, even in the sense of integration once you develop uh, the, the calculations of the IP3 signal. The ensuing <coughs> double step integration is accounting for your frequency response of the astrocytes that this is the single cell individual frequency response computed analytically and that matches exactly the, um, the experimental results and accounts for the fact that the population response indeed reflects your single individual cell response okay so just to make uh, the point we saw that so far the astrocytes will need a nonlinear response to stimuli, and that their shape of the nonlinearity is sigmoid in intermediate range of frequency of stimulation by your neuronal cultures are translated in a, a, an integration of the stimulus, and this is integration is at least the two steps. The next uh, is once we look at our cultures, exactly the same, the same. Uh, um, experiments that we were talking before. Recall what I was questioning before. I told you, does uh, the, global cal uh, the global calcium response uh, mimic a uh, single cell calcium response, or is also a combination of a population response uh, dictated by the possible connections within cells? How these connections could influence, indeed, uh, the global calcium response? Once you look uh, at the cultures and you sort uh, the possible frequency components of uh, the response of the single cells so to the stimulation of uh, by microelectric arrays, what you observe is uh, two populations, at least in these experiments, of responses. One population is characterized by low frequency components, sorry, a low frequency components, and the other population is at least uh, double fold the low frequency component population. Okay, it's a, that's a, the histogram that summarizes one population low frequency, other population high frequency. The assumptions that uh, we did is uh, each cell a priori is uh, sharing the same calcium machinery, calcium induced, calcium release. Isolated, isolated, sorry, my English sucks. Isolated, uh, the cell has a stereotype frequency response, right? The sigmoid shape. So all cells a priori should should have the same uh, type of uh, and the same qualitative and quantitative features of frequency response. So let's uh, figure it out how or what other aspects could trigger differences in the qualitative and quantitative features of this frequency response, considering all the anatomical possible uh, anatomical domains of all cells, and considering within the tiled uh, culture space, okay, only our astrocytes. We borrow the rationale found in literature, whereby astrocytes that have uh, the shares anatomical borders are very likely functionally connected, namely by gap junction channels, okay? And uh, what we do is trying to study the frequency response of these single population of clusters, you see like a cluster here, here, and whatever, all over, all over the, 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 the cultures, and try to figure it out how it happen, what happens to the frequency response. So you might not be surprised that something happens, right? And something happens here, it's lumped in these uh, three figures in which you observe that increasing the number of connections of cells uh, one cell to its neighbors shows that essentially the threshold for the activation of each astrocyte translated increases. Okay, and also you see the shape of the sigmoid the nonlinearity slightly changes. And at the same time, the maximum activation, the plateau or the level of saturation, decreases 
as the connectivity increases. So once you plot these two sets of data together, you have the conclusion that the threshold and the plateau are inversely correlated, as it is shown here. Which means that increasing the connectivity, this is your threshold frequency, this is your plateau. What happens is that as the connectivity increases, your window for integration okay, of the stimulus is shrinking. Which is itself interesting, but it tells you something more uh, relevant for the perspective of this talk. That is, the population and each cluster okay, can be thought to encode your stimulus or integrate it in a different fashion with respect to the other population. So, some... some can I ask how long will the end? Uh, yeah, sure. Let me just pause it. Until the end? No, no, it's fine. Go ahead. Why exactly when you have the clusters, you have a reduction in the threshold? Yeah, I am going to explain it in the next couple of slides. It's so. not, it's counterintuitive, isn't it? Yeah, I know. It's, it's counterintuitive. I'm going to explain it in a couple of slides. Yeah, yeah let's, we can leave the question after because there are lots of concepts. So, okay. So, to answer this question exactly and to understand what elements of the connections between cells could actually come at play in the modification of uh, the stimulus response, as well as uh, a fundamental aspect and assumption in our case is if uh, these uh, clusters form somehow some functional clusters, meaning they are doing some kind of uh, encoding of the calcium stimulus, of the calcium uh, of, uh, of the stimulation. Then uh, the next uh, step is we would like to understand how these uh, clusters could actually be functional. And uh, functional here, I take the basic assumption. Functionality is the ability of a population of cells to propagate calcium throughout the entire network. Okay, the idea is that your signal, as you recall it from the previous slides, must be your calcium signal, must be a signal that is manipulated in a controlled fashion. So each astrocyte has to be able to transmit the code <coughs> in a controlled and re uh, like reliable fashion. So we study how the signal propagates and for this, for this we consider realistic, uh, realistic, well, we consider three-dimensional astrocytic networks, okay, with uh, different kind of topologies and with the focus here of course is whether the connectivity plays a role the, the, the morphology of the network in terms of how connectivity is connection are arranged between cells and uh, what you observe is something very nice so the population or the network of astrocytes that are able to transmit signals okay are only the populations that are characterized by cells that do have a small number of connections with other cells, okay? And in parallel, they are characterized by cells that, uh, with respect to other cells, are distant an, a considerable number of cells. Meaning that for a calcium sigma to propagate from one cell to the other, it has to pass across many other cells is to relay a sort of telegraphy line, which is, if you think, completely the opposite of what happens in neural networks, right? And uh, you can, uh, there, is, there is a lot of discussion going on, this is just the published uh, recently, by the way. The point is that these two features are consistent with the connection rule that is uh, called uh, the so-called nearest neighbor, local connections, okay? So astrocyte has to be connected only to their close by neuro, near neighbors. There are no long range connections. And this matches exactly the morphological evidence whereby astrocytes do tile the brain space, but their domains, their anatomical domains never overlap. And they just are connected on their borders with just the surrounding cells. To answer the questions that you asked uh, just a couple of minutes before, the principle that underlies this is just uh, an explanatory, not so explanatory concept, but uh, you can imagine why. The wavefront, the activation okay, of your astrocyte can be thought 
to be diluted if you have long range connections because the wave front is brought to distant and in non active regions of the network. And so you have to activate more cells. If you have a, a connection that is limited to the near, near, nearby neighborhood, the, the bolus of calcium that you have there is somehow limited in its diffusion to just uh, the cells that are there. So you have a controlled diffusion, a controlled way of propagation. Clearly, this uh, diffusion differs because you may have this kind of networks and this kind of networks that are more similar to crystal lattices. All of, all, both of these networks share, on average, cells with the same number of connections. But you see, this is a realistic <coughs> network. Still, in the realistic network, with respect to the artificial network, although with the same number of connections, the propagation is, is uh, more enhanced uh, in the square lattice, meaning that the real the details of the local connections between astrocytes matters in the way this, these networks are, are uh, elaborating your signal. So, again, this makes you another point. The population of astrocytes do encode, you know, very likely, the calcium signal differently from a single cell. Okay? And uh, this, the transfer of this code in between cells take advantage of uh, nearest neighbors collection, con connections that should be sparse, meaning there must be a lot of other cells in between one cell to the other to allow diffusion. And uh, locally, this diffusion really depends on the neighborhood of your astrocytes. And the point is that uh, in all this discussion, if you notice, I didn't consider any kind of uh, specification on the morphology of our cells. So I just take the assumption of looking at global signals, right? Thinking about my astrocytes as spheres, a very simple approximation in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, our, in our discussion. The reality is, I'm afraid, a bit more complex, almost, almost if not even more, that's uh, my clear point, of neurons. Because the origin of these calcium signals is uh, the so-called astrocytic processes, which when you look at them in a two-photon two microscope and, uh, and as well as the micro, micro, electron microscope, what you observe is that the spatial and temporal dynamics of calcium in these processes can be very variable, can be confined within the process, even in subcellular regions, and propagates along the entire process, and even propagates through radiation process up to the cell zone, where putatively the integration of all the stimulus occurs. On the other hand, uh, these processes are themselves endowed with endoplasmic reticulum. They have all the basic features and the basic machinery for calcium induced calcium release. So this makes you think, well, maybe these processes are not mere transmission cables from the periphery to the sun, where traditionally some kind of coding is thought to occur. Maybe themselves somehow a kind of right? They do perform some sort of computation, some sort of encoding. Well, to, 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 from this idea, to prove it, maybe there is a little bit more work to do. And so we first have to develop a model of these astrocytic processes. And we can take here, we can borrow the rationale from the original experiments in 2011, in which uh, the Spatial temporal calcium dynamics within the process can be considered as the ensemble dynamics of calcium signals averaged over subcellular regions, sequential subcellular regions, okay, of your of your uh, of your process, which is equivalent from a modeling point of view of decomposing your process in a, a sequence of concatenated compartments. Each compartment can be thought, for example, as an equivalent cylinder with some kind of cytosolic space and they go with its own endoplasmic reticulum uh, stores, its own calcium machinery and its own synaptic inputs. Okay? 
because it's not still uh, completely confirmed, but it looks like uh, that there is a uniform distribution of synaptic inputs along the atrocytic processes, whereby each of these uh, compartments corresponds to its own synaptic inputs, and it's also morphologically correlated with some kind of enlargement locally or in the plaque nucleotide diffusion stores. We prove that uh, this kind of approach is uh, successful in uh, reconstructing the astrocytic processes and the dynamics of calcium observed in, uh, in experiments. In this case, you have three reconstructed processes with uh, two different, with different uh, input uh, configurations. And you see that the simulation matches almost too closely both the calcium peak uh, propagation and delay during the propagation along the astrocytes. So because uh, studying this kind of uh, system is very challenging from a technical point of view, this model, at least, uh, that's the rationale for the next uh, few slides, allows you to have surrogate artificial realistic astrocytic process reconstructed and to perform some kind of simulations and, and, and investigations to see how these processes could possibly encode and, 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 and process and perform computations on your, on your thing. So the first, uh, uh, the first uh, for example, the first uh, mm, thing that we want to see, and that's uh, some work that was inspired by Yota's uh, papers in Newton, is pairwise summation. All right, so seeing how the stimulus are integrated. And uh, if you are not familiar, so we look about the actual response at a probing location. Okay, we measure the calcium response, for example, here at the bottom of an hour, our astrocytic process in, uh, uh, in response to two synchronous stimulations. Okay? And we compare this actual peak okay, with uh, the expected peak in this case, for example, given by the sum of the independent responses <coughs> triggered individually by synaptic stimulus A and A and B. And uh, what we observe is that uh, uh, you have, well, perhaps not uh, no surprisingly, you have some sort of, well, you can maybe describe it as a sigmoid shape, although we are still investigating it, but more or less, it's strongly nonlinear. And uh, in particular, you have a region in which it's supralinear because it actually sits above the diagonal, a region instead in which you have saturation due to sublinearity, and a region very likely in which you have linear integration. I can anticipate that this region actually works as a multiplication. Okay? So it's not actually the sum, but it's a multiplication of the stimulus. Point is that uh, another aspect is okay, we have a nonlinear integration and uh, what about if I change instead uh, the location of a measure? Do I observe the same? Which is not trivial to say yes, I observe uh, indeed uh, the same qualitative uh, features of uh, minolinearity, I mean, you know, supralinearity and sublinearity and saturation here, <coughs> but if you look closely there is uh, some changes in the quantitative features of this curve suggesting that, uh, indeed, where you are measuring your calcium signal, the location along the process do matter to infer what this uh, process is doing and performing on your stimulation. So the advantage of the model that it would be impossible experimentally is uh, coming up with this idea. So if this uh, local location of the probing measure matters, Somehow, you may argue, these are independent stimuli and, uh, and, uh, and uh, these are computed for all the stimuli in all possible positions. You may argue that uh, these uh, differences in the probing location is due, possibly, to the fact that uh, uh, the, uh, the process has some kind of structure. So the structure of this process dictates how is encoding the information about their stimulus. And uh, we do very nice uh, um, proof of concept. We imagine to have our astrocytic process and we shuffle all the compartments. So you have the same component, you're just uh, shuffling them. If there is no influence of the structural organization of this astrocyte, because I'm not changing the ingredients of how the process is done, I should observe exactly the same, the same the same uh, uh, nonlinear response. 
Instead, if there is uh, some change in the structure, well, the nonlinear response should be, well, qualitatively similar, but you see quantitatively different. And this difference ranges from the fact that, that the minimum and maximum of each region in which I am dividing, subdividing my process is actually changing when I do this factoring. And so the fact that you, if each compartment okay, correlates with uh, the morphology of the process, then the extent that the structural organization of your, of your process represented by the order, the order sequences of these uh, compartments link to the fact that there is some kind of organization of your process with respect to the coding. This uh, functional organization can therefore stem out from either the length of the process and the configuration of the stimulus. So to tackle these two aspects before, just a small intermezzo, the next couple of slides will be extensively used this kind of uh, formalism. This is called uh, in technical terms a bifurcation diagram. And it's a very compact way to represent all possible dynamical possibilities of calcium in response to your stimulus strength in this case, meaning how much you are stimulated, for example, at what frequency. So look, if you look at continuous lines, you see a type of response that essentially, eventually is just a, a short transient and then converge to some kind of stable level. So you may argue that if there is some kind of uh, computation, it's just a temporal propagation or something that your, your process is doing for a transient moment. Instead, uh, when you are inside this uh, beige or gray envelope, what you observe is that you have essentially stable oscillations, okay? And so it, the peak of these oscillations as well as their frequency Okay, it's changing somehow in a nonlinear fashion with the amplitude of the stem of the stimulus. And you have also some other more complex regions in which you have, for example, these uh, field dots together with the um, empty dots, in which, depending on where is your process in terms of how much calcium you have originally when the, st when the stimulus is impinging on the process, you may have both oscillations and convergence to one of the states. So in this region, essentially, you may have multiple states of encoding, something that is called multistability in technical terms. So back to the idea that we said the functional organization might depend on the process configuration or on the stimulus rotation. Let's tackle first uh, the process configuration. Okay? If the structure matters, then uh, we shall ask uh, what is the impact of the length, how big, how the field of view, how the spatial scales is important for understanding what the calcium signal is performing or how it's manipulated. Well, it's uh, remarkably different because once you plot those bifurcation diagrams, you can take, for example, the complexity of these bifurcation diagrams as a measure of the possible computations and the possible manipulations that your process is doing. So what you observe is, for example, in this uh, three-segment process, you see that the envelope is changing across compartments. These are just identical compartments, so it means essentially that depending on where you are stimulating, your, your uh, response is different, something that we observed before no? in, the, in the stimulus integration, but this is a theoretical proof. But what is probably more relevant as well is that across different processes, different for the length, the shape and the complexity of these uh, diagrams increases. You may notice that uh, even the, the shorter is inherited by the longer with additional features. So it means that longer processes are able to encode and perform multiple ways of encoding on your stimulus in terms of their calcium signal. However, I'd like to focus your attention on these examples. The more the process is increasing, and you can think as these also not as different processes, but as segments of different length within the same process. So you may say that the same region, the red, depending on the scale of the, of the spatial scale of the calcium signal, is encoding differently. So depending on this aspect, you have essentially the fact that uh, the spatial scale 
is responsible for multiple states of encoding. And there, is, there must be, however, a trade-off, because at some point you have too many states, and this is not robust any longer. A small perturbation may trigger, you know, may be detrimental for the way the signal is encoded and cannot be transferred any longer to further regions of, of your, of your uh, process. And in terms of stimulus configuration, again, perhaps not surprising, the stimulus location, of course, matters again. So depending on the same stimulus in different regions of the process is encoded in a different fashion. And the same stimulus, but changing in the configuration, is also giving different kinds of diagrams, so different ways of processing this calcium signal. And the last figure tells you something perhaps uh, more elaborated. It means that your processes are there, and they respond to specific stimulus configuration in a different fashion. So because these processes are immersed in the neurofile, perhaps there is a tight association, morphological and functional, with the surrounding synaptic environment. OK? And I would like to, just in the few slides uh, that remains, to elaborate further this concept. Once you look uh, indeed uh, at your uh, brain, uh, astrocytes are there, interspersed in neuronal cultures. Okay? You may have uh, an astrocyte in the cortex that uh, really engraves uh, neuronal somatic. And uh, you have uh, millions, and we are talking about two millions in the human brain, synapses in, within uh, the anatomical domain of a single astrocyte, a huge number. This uh, anatomical coupling is really morphologically coupling, because at the ultrastructure, most of the time, astrocytic processes engraft synapses. So this has led to the idea that actually neural networks in the brain are not really only neural networks. The network, the circuitry of the brain, is a neuroglia network. Okay? And uh, the morphology <coughs> was, uh, was proven to be functionally uh, an, a proof of uh, an, a hint of a functionally, functional pattern. Because the conventional view of the synapse has been implemented and complemented over the past uh, 20 years with uh, some more details. Your neurotransmitter can spill out of your synaptic cleft and trigger calcium responses in the surrounding astrocytic processes. But this calcium phenomenon that we studied so far is actually triggering most of the time isocytosis of other neurotransmitter from your astrocyte that can either feed back on postsynaptic um, terminals and presynaptic terminals with a lot of possible uh, modulations uh, and, and effects so that we were just uh, going to discuss shortly. And uh, this, this phenomena is also modulated by other permissive factors, so very complicated. And more, even more importantly, the effect may not be confined to the single synapse that trigger regionally the calcium, but because of calcium propagation, it can just uh, navigate along other special domains. So this has led to the idea that your uh, conventional synapse that was thought to be bipartite, okay, with a pre and a post synaptic terminal, becomes tripartite with three elements once the astrocytic process is taken into consideration if it's an active element of synaptic transmission. And uh, more or less importantly from the um, information point of view is that the conventional view of unidirectional flow of information from the presynaptic to the postsynaptic is broken when you consider your astrocyte because you have the introduction of feedback and feed forward loops. And the entire system, the tripartite synapse, is not any longer uh, input out, one input, one output system, but it can have multiple input and multiple output once you consider the spatial propagation of calcium signals, right? Once of these, uh, once of these, um, once of these uh, mechanisms, namely this uh, feedback loop, for example, the most characterized loop in astrocyte regulation of synaptic transmission, is responsible for a transient increase as far as calcium is going on, calcium dynamics is going on in the astrocyte, a transient, is responsible for a transient increase of synaptic release, which coordinates okay, with 
uh, decrease in the pair pool's plasticity. You know the mechanism, right? This is presynaptically modified. I am increasing the synaptic release, uh, spontaneous synaptic release of the probability spontaneous release by the astrocyte, and this somehow allows my synapse to deplete faster. So in pair pool's stimulation, depletion is more probable, and the synapse is not any longer facilitating, but becomes depressing. From a modeling point of view, this is uh, clearly done once you consider the modulation by the you know, neurotransmitter release from the astrocyte, which is called glial transmitter because it's a neurotransmitter of glia origin. Okay. Once this uh, glial transmitter modulate your resting calcium levels in the in, in the in the synaptic space, meaning you know the calcium the basal calcium hypothesis of synaptic release. The level of intrasynaptic calcium concentration dictates the probability of release of your neurotransmitter from the presynaptic terminal. The point is that this uh, intrasynaptic resting value is usually fixed in many models. Once you consider the astrocyte, this changes considerably. So you have a calcium peak, some kind of release of your glutamate, of your neurotransmitter can be also glutamate, and an activation of your presynaptic receptors and eventually the modulation of your intrasynaptic calcium levels at rest with an increase, which is responsible for a transient increase overall of the probability of synaptic release, which is very well described with a change in parallel to what I showed you before experimentally of, of the plasticity, so, of the purpose plasticity. So the conventional view is that once you look at your original synapse, okay, in this case, each dot represents how much is facilitating green and how much is depressing with respect to the previous event of release. So, purpose depression and purpose facilitation. Once you have a release from the astrocyte of a neurotransmitter, you see that in concomitance of the release, there is a dramatic change according to this mechanism of your plasticity. Plasticity is the way your synapse is transmitting and is filtering your information. And the point is that it's not only restricted to one event. In reality, your astrocytes are going on with spontaneous calcium signals even. You have constant activation of your astrocytes. So you look at this, you take into account this idea, and your synaptic terminals are constantly modulated in time by your astrocytes. So it's not uh, as conventional as assumed that the plasticity is fixed. There is always ongoing modulation even by astrocytic terminals. And uh, once you look at the frequency of release of these, uh, of these events, okay, well, you may imagine that as more as you increase the frequency of, uh, of release of neurotransmitter from the astrocyte, the more, essentially, on average, you are able to modulate and change in a more or less uh, persistent way <coughs> the way you are transmitting your stimulus in terms of synaptic, short-term synaptic plasticity. Okay, but the, the really remarkable aspect is that calcium activity is not only triggering the release of glutamate or gliotransmitters that are affecting your calcium levels inside the presynaptic terminal, but it's the very same neurotransmitter released by the synapse that is skipping or is actually activating the calcium signal that is responsible for this modulation of the synapse. And this loop is uh, somehow remarkable because it's characterized by a clear time scale separation, whereby the activation by neurotransmitter of uh, calcium signals and the release <coughs> of neurotransmitter and the starting and the onset of the modulation of the intrasynaptic calcium levels by the astrocyte are very fast. You see the time scale. It's even on the order of milliseconds, actually, sorry. It's even on the order of, uh, of synaptic transmission typical time scales. But the duration of the modulation of the release probability by means of modulation of calcium, of calcium levels inside the synapse by the neurotransmitter release and as well the calcium signal in the astrocyte are way farther slower. So this is. Uh, um, paradise for modelers because when you have the time scale separations 
you can think about interesting, uh, interesting things that could come up. And one of these interesting things is, uh, for example, this semi-ideal, because it's been proved experimentally, ideal experiment. Imagine you consider a synaptic terminal in which you apply 85, which is just, you know, uh, you work with an 85 condition. 85 is a blocker of an NB receptors. So you apply to your synapse a stimulus at high frequency at some, time, at some point, okay? And uh, what you observe is that after this high frequency stimulation, a priori, that once you cheese it, your synapse with the original basal background stimulation is releasing in the same fashion as before the high frequency stimulation because this is the implicit assumption. You don't have any form of NMDA long-term plasticity assuming that NMDA mediated plasticity here in my synapse is the only form of long-term potentiation, okay? So just a, just a non-increase, poten uh, poten like a permanent increase of no potentiation. So once you plot all the release, the resources after the stimulatory cue, you observe no change in the way you are transmitting your original stimulation. So not changing the amplitude of, uh, of uh, postsynaptic currents. These changes locally are short-term plasticity changes, okay? But once you take into account the astrocyte, something else changes. What you see is the same mechanism, same AP5, but the astrocyte kicks in and uh, after the high frequency stimulation, surprisingly more or less, your, um, your amplitude of postsynaptic currents is persistently increased. And it can persist uh, as much as you want as far as the stimulation is sufficient to what? To keep your astrocyte activated. What is remarkable is that this uh, stimulus is exactly the same. And the frequency of stimulation before and after the stimulatory cue is the same. Okay? But why in the astrocyte you have persistent potentiation that is a presynaptic mechanism according to what I showed you before and can last uh, as much as I want? Because uh, after the stimulatory cue for the mechanism that I told you, the astrocyte has released some kind of biotransmitter. And this biotransmitter is releasing, is allowing the synapse to release more neurotransmitter. So when I go back, my stimulus is the one that I had originally, but my synapse, because of the action of the astrocyte, is not releasing as it was doing before, it's releasing more. And this additional release is sufficient to keep the astrocyte activated and to release continuously the transmitter. So you have a mechanism of persistent, long-term persistent, uh, increase of synaptic release. And this mechanism, maybe you can just extrapolate some ideas, eventually it proves uh, some kind of interesting once you tweak uh, the astrocyte and you put it in the context of the networks. Because in this uh, simple schematized network, the stimulatory cue just, you know, is presented here between 10 and 20 and triggers some kind of postsynaptic increased firing. But after the stimulatory cue, you return to original, on average, rate of firing. But once you kick in the astrocyte, okay, once you kick in the astrocyte, something else changes. By means of the persistent increase of a synaptic release and the persistent potentiation of synaptic currents, <coughs> at the disappearance of the Q, your increased activity is remaining. So you have a mechanism for persistent activity. And uh, maybe I just uh, can mention it. It's even a little bit uh, more intriguing. The, um, the statistics of this uh, persistent activity is uh, more uh, stochastic than uh, the original. Meaning that uh, this is uh, usually it's a debated proof of working memory sometimes. So this mechanism can actually be involved, uh, perhaps, or can provide an alternative mechanism of working memory and have some kind of functions in uh, the computation and cognitive uh, tasks performed by the brain. So to conclude, imagine that you have these cells. And uh, of course, uh, this is on a network level, but imagine to take all these arguments to the level of a process. 
And from what I show you, each process is somehow elaborating different according to the spatial scales and the regulation of the plasticity locally at the level of single subcellular regions of the processes can be dynamic and change. So once you look and you think about your network uh, space, and your network space becomes styled in regions, very likely, in which plasticity is controlled in a dynamical fashion and concerted by calcium signals of the astrocyte. But also it tells you that perhaps network activity may be fault not only for the source of network activity, becomes fundamentally focused on the plasticity region. So the synapses becomes the real source of your network dynamics. So you may think as network, a neural network of activities with clear is actually a network of three party synapses in which the neurons are actually relaying in some kind of nonlinear fashion the activity that is modulated at a different type of nodes, which are the three party synapses. Let me acknowledge the people that are behind this work. So my collaborator, Hugues Berry, and uh, Jules, that, is, uh, uh, that work uh, on, on the propagation of uh, calcium signals in network as well, and is graduating soon. And then my former mentor at Tel Aviv University, Esher ben Yaakov and Yaranin, and Paolo Bonifazzi. Gilad and Nitsan actually were, uh, were behind the work on uh, on uh, the experiments and some of the work that uh, we saw on, uh, on, uh, on the characterization of the response of astrocytes. And external collaborators, especially for the work on uh, processes, Andrea Volterra and Nicola Leonde from the University of Lausanne, and Vladimir for Parpura from Birmingham University of Alabama for the gliotransmitter part, and Vladislav Olman, now in industry, that. Uh, Ten years ago, before I started this, was one of the first uh, to publish the idea that the glial transmission could actually gate information transfer in synapses. And uh, funding acknowledgement, uh, I'm glad uh, I am a fellowship <coughs> of the Alain de Susan and part of this work, previous to 2012, was done in the Italy Israel Joint Neuroscience Lab. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Uh, you mentioned that the persistent activity is more stochastic. Uh, how do you quantify that? Do you look at the frequency, the ICI, or something else? Do you want that? regulation, your uh, uh, coefficient of variation, which uh, is without in, without astrocytes of this type, okay, variety, these are cortical neurons. Okay. The fact that you have a bump here is due to the fact that you have a close uh, resetting potential with respect to the pressure. Otherwise, this bump in other regions with uh, lower resetting potential doesn't exist. But the change in the synaptic plasticity triggered by your astrocyte is essentially responsible for a shift of the coefficient of variation of the frequency, the firing frequency, the interspike interval, actually distribution of your uh, networks, of your, of your neurons, towards lower values of stimulation, which is consistent once you plot the analysis and the bifurcation diagrams with a bistability of your coefficient of variation. So that's, uh, these are of course Poissonian uh, frames, okay? So you have an increase in the stochasticity in this sense. You like become more Poisson, so you are uh, more stochastic somehow. Okay, thank you. I really know to that now. Okay, right. <laughs> So you have a prediction about the structure of the glia that is very beginning. Can we actually block the, the, the gap junctions between the astrocytes yes. and see? So uh, yes, uh, you can block them. 
um, in order, why you want to block them? In order to have, you mean the... To the isolate the effect of the network? Uh, yes, but the point, uh, the point is that uh, not only it's a matter of isolating, because you may find, uh, you may find, uh, you may find, uh, you may find uh, uh, in the cortex, in layer four, layer three, you may find isolated astrocytes. Still, nevertheless, when you observe the astrocytes, these are uh, early experiments, for example, 1996, well, these were in slides, this one was in slides, but then later on were shown to be in a, in a, in a, in a reality C2. Um, the point is that you have different mechanisms of propagation of your calcium. So the, the famous mechanism from mediated by gap junction is what you what you measure is the propagation of calcium, but what it actually diffuses from one cell and the other is the second messenger at the print. So the propagation is a regeneration okay. The point is that this mechanism is not the only one. You have also another mechanism in parallel or region dependent that could be mediated by the release of ATP in an exocytote that in a calcium dependent fashion from your astrocyte diffuses hypercellularly and in non-connected astrocytes can actually trigger activation. So blocking the gap junction is not the only way to assure that you have isolated, isolated cells. And the way around. The, there is another experimental challenge, which is locating where your synaptic inputs are. Mm -hmm. Because there is still, we are not able to stimulate single fibers, single presynaptic buttons, and record over there locally the, the calcium response. So, I mean, they are doing it now, it's, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come out in, in the next couple of years. But the level, the technological challenges represented by, by this field uh, in, in experiments are really, really still tough because the technology is start to just develop. I mean, you think that till 2010, it was almost not possible to, to map okay, calcium signals in the processes. They were all global or in, in sub-region that they were considering primary processes and even there was not the tail of the process. The study that I showed you before by, by, by well, I can't go back. The study that uh, I showed you before by, by Volterra and uh, Di Castro from Volterra's lab that we use for modeling. It was the first study of this kind that was using traditional technology, readapted, so the photon microscope, to, to get signals within the process and you know, to have a, a reliable picture of special temporal dynamics. It was in 2011, but in 2010, you have the first study that uses GCAMP. So with GCAMP, now it's possible to start using you know, new technology to really visualize locally calcium signals. And uh, there is now the new wave of experiments that are focusing on this, on this aspect and hopefully that will provide uh, some kind of, uh, of, uh, of information. Imagine even that this, the time scale of these events is uh, remarkably, remarkably changed over, over the years. It was uh, original views, the one that I showed you was like seconds, 10 seconds, my dad what he's doing, and going back on the milliards even, even before, even below. And now, if I look at the process locally, calcium event, in the process, scales almost as 100 milliseconds. So we are very close to synaptic calcium events in terms of time scales. So the idea is that this, uh, this interaction is essentially that the synapse is regulated by astrosynapse synapses, so the specialized junctions. Okay? I mean, you have, uh, you have electron microscope results that uh, suggest that you have really almost like the synapses pools of vesicles, you might have docking, you have itself a vesicular cycle, so you're recycling. I mean, there is some remarkable analogies. You can't imply really that the things work in the same fashion, but there are like remarkable analogies that are useful, uh, at least from right now for, for also a modeling company. Okay. And your pastures are mixed union pastures? Yes. Which means that you have different glial 
No, uh, yeah, right, that's a very good question. Well, um, so first of all, there are, we don't know if there is microglia. I know. Ever that. Even oligodendrocytes, I mean. Well, oligodendrocytes, um, oligodendrocytes are not really a problem because uh, calcium dynamics of this type is observed in oligodendrocytes as well. So, is it possible with your any idea if the interglia talk might affect the synapse at the end? Oh yeah, yeah, uh, for sure. And not only astrocyte, astrocyte, but also mm -hmm. microglia astrocyte. Yeah, yeah, there is, there is, there is. There are studies that show you this. Even it's it's ongoing work, but there are like um, it, it's emerging the fact that the microglia could actually be responsible or a change even in the way your astrocyte is working. You know, the, so the synapse now is even not any longer tripartite, it becomes tetrapartite because we are considering the, the, the microglia cells that goes there. My, my pick on this, and uh, I must admit that I, I don't know very much in detail microglia physiology, but is that um, mm, microglia does have a role, very likely, but these uh, results on single astrocytes with not considered microglia <coughs> remains very likely valid because microglia, as it is shown, for example, for other microglia, you may think it as a source of uh, inflammatory signals, right, or immuno, 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 immuno response uh, signals somehow at some level. And uh, you take an analogy, for example, neurotransmission in the astrocyte is uh, regulated by the NFL. So there is uh, some kind of emerging idea in this respect that uh, this factor coexists uh, in a subtle balance, okay? And uh, the system is in this sort of uh, tunable response whereby the microglia stands by and when it gets activated, then it's the initiation of a completely different dynamic regime and it's a regime that is not any longer physiological, it becomes pathophysiological in some sense. So, you don't agree, I see. No, I agree. Right. Because good. there is the activated microglia which can cause something like this, but the microglia which is not activated also exists, yeah, and yeah. it exists on the top of the actual initial segment, for example, which is not pathological. On the top of? The actual initial segment. For example, axon, initial axon initial cell. Yeah, sure. But so um, not only. Yes, I know, okay. But uh, um, I don't know if you have. Uh, does this microglia response to, to the generation of. Uh, yes, I don't know. I have no idea. But so I, I can tell you that uh, you have uh, one study that shows that uh, modulation, these are astrocytes that sit on the axonal projection. So this cells are able to modulate the shape of your action potential. Mm -hmm. So you have another mechanism to modulate even to the synaptic release because once the action potential arrives to the synaptic terminal, the different shapes okay, trigger a different way of the inflow of calcium from the cellular space so you change the way you're able to. This is the only study that shows the modulation of action potential shape by the astrocytes because the astrocyte sits on the, on the axon. But uh, on microglia, uh, no. Honestly, on microglia in axons, I, I don't know any kind of work of this kind. So, sorry. Thank you. Thanks.